conference so far. all of you here because I feel like this is a couple hundred of my closest friends. So uh, thank you for, for coming. I want to say this is the beginning of something we'd like to continue. Um, we are looking at making this a beachhead. This is the beginning of something we'd like to grow. And what we initially planned, some of you knew that I had a pretty ambitious lineup about six months ago. I really wanted the world. And I've managed to kind of cull my ideas down to the core. <laughs> however, however, we're going to have some interesting speakers over the next year. Uh, I think this is a jumping off point, because for one thing, I think we all agree that we need to continue talking about this. And as part of that, I'd like to bring uh, James Howard Kunstler here in the fall and have him speak, those of you who know Kunstler, and if you don't, please read The Long Emergency and now this new book, Too Much Magic. Uh, he just came out with a new book and we'd like to have him uh, host him here and have him speak to a larger audience. We'd like to have it while the students are here and we'll try to arrange it for this fall. In addition, we had planned to honor, and we are still honoring the authors of uh, the, the 40th anniversary of Limits to Growth. And one of the authors is Jorgen Randers. Jorgen Randers is a climate scientist. He lives in Norway. And so it's quite a uh, carbon footprint to fly him out here. And we couldn't really justify flying him here just to speak to us for a couple hours. So we're trying to put together a tour so he could tour the West Coast. So we're trying to organize that for this winter and we hope that he will stop here on this tour to give some thoughts about 2052. By then, I hope all of you will have read it and we'll have some interesting questions for him. Then we'd like to have other speakers next year uh, and we'll do more of the same. So I think we've got something good here and I hope that you join us in the future. So before we get started with our keynote tonight, um, I mentioned to you earlier that one of the people we are dedicating the conference to is Ernest Kallenbach from Ecotopia. And I, and I wanted to read something to you to just whet your appetite to read this because we're going to send this to you after the conference. And actually, I just learned of this myself. I didn't know of this earlier. But there was a document left on his computer uh, after his death. And it's called Epistle to the Ecotopians. And I'm just going to read you the first page. And then you will have to download and read the rest. To all brothers and sisters who hold the dream in their hearts of a future world in which humans and all other beings live in harmony and mutual support, a world of sustainability, stability, and confidence, a world something like the one I described so long ago in Ecotopia and Ecotopia emerging. As I survey my life, which is coming near its end, I want to set down a few thoughts that might be useful to those coming after. It will soon be time for me to give back to Gaia the nutrients that I have used during a long, busy, and happy life. I'm not bitter or resentful at the approaching end. I have been one of the extraordinary lucky ones. So it behooves me here to gather together some thoughts and attitudes that may prove useful in the dark times we are facing a century or more of exceedingly difficult times. How will those who survive manage it? What can we teach our friends, our children, our communities? Although we may not be capable of changing history, how can we equip ourselves to survive it? I contemplate these questions in the full consciousness of my own mortality being offered an actual number of likely months to live, even though the estimate is uncertain, mightily focuses the mind. On personal things, of course, on loved ones, and even loved things, but also on the big picture. But let us begin with the last things first for a change. The analysis will come later for those who wish it. So that is the first page of a document that I think we all should read and you will be receiving it from us after the conference. But now to our keynote. Richard Heinberg is an inspiration to many of us, and for those of you who are not familiar with him, he is one of the leading proponents of discussions about um, peak oil and the decline of the 
End of Growth. This is his most recent book. For those of you who haven't read it, read it. And for those of you who have read it, we're going to talk about life after growth. One of the people in our group, Maureen, are you here? Oh, okay. Well, Maureen, we have a little group here called Humboldt Village. Humboldt Village is the beginning of a transition movement. We want to start a transition movement in this community. And in one of our meetings, she said something really fascinating, just blurted it out. She said, you know what? Less is the new more. And I thought, now there's a t-shirt. And we're going to have t-shirts made on that. Less is the new more. We really need to take that to heart. We are entering times of change, and we need to really decide what we value. And I think Richard Heinberg is going to talk to us about some very serious things and some things we need to really contemplate carefully and think about less is the new more. Because we are entering a time where we're going to need each other more than ever, and we're going to have to learn to get by with less. Richard Heinberg is, it's an honor to have him here. Richard Heinberg, I'd like to uh, present you to the Humboldt County and Northern California audience. Thanks, Lou. Oh, thank you so much. It's, it's a delight to be here. Uh, the, uh, I'm s sorry I had to miss the first part of the conference, but uh, I think it's, absolutely fabulous that you have this conference on adaptation creating a resilient future it's the kind of conference that should be going on in every town and city in this country and around the world um, i'm sure you've already heard a lot of depressing and inspiring information. What I hope to do over the course of the next, uh, I'm going to aim for about 50 minutes, is uh, provide some, some perspective on um, sort of how we got to where we are and how some of the problems that are facing us are likely to interact, how they, uh, how they uh, fit in with one another and uh, how we're going to have to adapt to them. Um, and I want to leave lots of time for questions at the end, because I know some of you have, uh, have already read the book. Uh, so the frame that we're going to be using for this discussion is economic growth, which is something that we all sort of take for granted. Uh, every politician promises more of it, right? Uh, the, the assumption is that economic growth has been going on for a long time, it's more or less inevitable. And we can have lots more of it in the future. Uh, I'm going to suggest that all three of those assumptions are wrong. Yes. <laughs> uh, first of all, you know, I mean, is, is it really possible to have uh, an economy that grows constantly in perpetuity? Uh, think of it this way. Suppose we had a, a magic hamster. You know, a, a newborn hamster grows very rapidly. In the first few weeks of its life, it doubles its body weight every week. So uh, let's suppose we had a magic hamster that continued doubling its body weight every week for one whole year, 52 doublings. How big a hamster would we have? Would it be a 50-pound hamster, a 500-pound hamster? Let, let me do the math for you. It would be a 9 billion ton hamster. That's the magic of compound growth. That's what we're dealing with. And when we talk about economic growth, that's what we're talking about, compound, uh, compounded growth. So what's China doing? China's growing its economy at about 10% per year over the last few years. It's starting to slow down now. Good, yes. Uh, but what does that mean, 10% per year? That means that China's economy is doubling in size every 10 years. How many times can it do that? You know, China is trying to become the magic hamster. 
And in fact, we all are trying to become the impossible hamster. This hasn't been going on all that long. You look back just the last 2,000 years, and when we talk about economic growth, we're talking about growth in GDP, gross domestic product, which is just basically all the money that's spent in an economy on an annual basis. GDP growth, you know, the last 2,000 years with the rise and fall of, of civilizations and all the rest, you know, barely shows up until just the last 200 years. Suddenly we have all of this new economic activity. And of course, world population growth has also really just taken off in the last 200 years. Well, what the hell has been happening in the last 200 years? Well, we found sources of energy. This is uh, world energy consumption, as, as you notice here. Uh, the, the stuff on top, biomass, is the energy source that we've been using for the longest. We've been using it basically since we we were human, since we invented our wealth, since we harnessed fire, okay? But if you just think in terms of renewable energy, we're only using about twice as much renewable energy today as we were in 1800, when there were only one billion human beings on the planet. So almost all of the growth in energy has come in coal, oil, natural gas, the fossil fuels. Why? What's the big deal about fossil fuels? Well, they are stored solar energy. We used, we've been using energy from the sun, again, from, from the very beginning, but we, before we started using fossil fuels, it was sort of on an annual basis, you know, it was how much solar energy could be absorbed by trees and, and crops and fed to animals and, and so on. And that's how we harnessed energy and we exerted energy into our environment by way of muscle power. With fossil fuels, we gained access to stored sunlight energy that had been compressed and transformed over the course of tens of millions of years. Uh, two brief periods, ironically, of global warming led to the creation of oil uh, 150 million years ago and 90 million years ago. So tens of millions of years to form this stuff, and we will have used all of the best of it in the course of just 200 years. So you can imagine the incredible economic benefits of using this stuff. Uh, maybe you've had the experience of running out of gas in your car and having to push your car 10 feet off to the side of the road. That's a lot of work. Okay, imagine pushing your car 20 or 30 miles. How much work is that? It's something like six or eight weeks of hard human labor. We get that done for us. We get our cars pushed for 20 or 30 miles by a single gallon of gasoline, for which we're paying $3.50 and complaining, right? Okay, so imagine if you could get six or eight weeks of, of labor for $3.50. You can't get labor that cheap in China or Vietnam or any place else. Well, that's what has led to the dramatic economic growth of the past 200 years. Now, the idea that economic growth might not be something that could go on forever is not a unique or new one. Uh, this book, published in 1972, it was very controversial at the time. It went on to become the best-selling environmental book of all time, Limits to Growth. It was a report on the work of a team of MIT scientists who used a computer to model future scenarios based on population growth, resource depletion, uh, and pollution. Uh, and they came up with a, a, a whole set of scenarios, but the 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 base run scenario, which kept coming up again and again, showed a peak and decline in world industrial output sometime in the first couple of decades of the 21st century. Now, of course, this report was maligned very soon after it was released by uh, mainstream economists who just could not countenance the idea that economic growth was, might have limits to it. Um, but. Subsequent studies, very recent ones, just over the last couple of years, that have gone back and looked at 
these scenarios and compared them with what's actually happened over the last 40 years, uh, have determined that the base case scenario is actually within about 15% of uh, accuracy on all its parameters. So we're right on track. <laughs> now, the limits to growth study focused particularly on factors having to do with uh, resources and depletion of resources and the degradation of the environment, right? It didn't look at elements within societal systems and how those could actually lead to uh, limits to growth also. And I, I would say, you know, looking back in retrospect, one thing that they didn't take into account that is actually coming to bite us in real time is debt. So I'm going to start there. I'm going to talk a little bit about debt and what's actually going on right now in our economic and financial world with regard to debt. It all started really uh, early in the industrial period when with things like powered assembly lines, it became possible to make stuff in larger quantities than we ever had before and faster than we ever had. So the, the problem then was a problem of overproduction. People were not accustomed to buying that much stuff and they didn't have the wherewithal to buy that much stuff. So this was, a, this was a problem for industry and for the financial and economic system in totality. It was solved with a couple of important strategies, one of which was advertising. Talking people into buying stuff that they didn't realize they needed. Uh. <clears throat> this is an ad for a Studebaker in uh, 1910. And, uh, we don't have time to do a psychoanalysis of this ad, but uh, uh, it, it's, I, I've, I've done it on other occasions and it's pretty, pretty interesting. Anyway, well, another time. Um, <laughs> 1910 Studebaker cost uh, $900. Doesn't sound like very much in today's terms, a new car for $900. But in, in 1910, $900 was a lot of money. So you can talk people into wanting these things, and that's a, a useful first step, but, but still not many people are going to be able to pony up $900 in cash to buy one. So the other big strategy that was adopted over the course of the 20th century was consumer credit strategies to make economic growth happen. Okay, so consumer credit was a way of helping people to more easily go into debt so they could buy stuff. Consume now, pay later. It pushes consumption forward in time. That's, that's the function of debt. And it's, it's worked very well. Now, along the way, um, we had to make some modifications to the system. And one of the systems we had to modify was our monetary system. Because at the start of the 20th, 20th century, we had money that was still based in precious metals, gold and silver. And there was only so much gold and silver around. So that kind of put brakes on the process of economic expansion. So over the course of the 20th century, the links between metals and money were gradually severed. Now, some people say that was a, a really bad thing. We should go back to uh, gold and silver-based money. I'm not in that camp myself. Because if you go back to the 19th century, when we had gold and silver money, there were robber barons and extreme ec economic inequality and, and awful stock market crashes and depressions and all the rest. So hard money is no guarantee of, of, of good economic times or, or sound currency or anything else. Uh, nevertheless, the delinking of money from precious metals had some effects. What did we replace gold and silver with? Well, with debt. Uh, debt is money today, and money is debt. If you go into a bank and take out a loan for $10,000, the banker doesn't scurry off into the vault and try to find $10,000 that somebody else left there. 
No, a deposit is created in your account for that $10,000, and that money is, is created on the spot. At the moment the loan is approved. And when you pay back that loan, the money disappears. Now, that's real magic. Uh, but the, the, that's not the whole story, because, of course, you have to pay interest on that loan. And the bank doesn't create that interest money at the same time the loan is created. So where does that come from? It comes from you doing business with other people in the economy, selling them stuff or working for them. And so if they're taking out loans and they're doing other business with people who are taking out loans, the total money supply is growing all the time so that theoretically everybody will be able to pay back their loans with interest as long as their business is flourishing and so on. If you think about it, it's kind of a, a pyramid scheme or a, a confidence game because it really depends upon everyone having the confidence that the whole economy is going to continue growing. Because if we lose that confidence, then nobody's going to want to loan anybody else money. And the whole thing will start to implode. Which is what happened during the 1930s, and it's what has started to happen uh, more recently. But we'll get to that in a moment. Another little piece of history we have to fill in in the meantime, which is in the 1980s. That's when globalization got its start, as a result of some simple technological uh, um, innovations like container shipping and satellite communications and computer monitoring of inventories. So globalization became feasible, and what that did was put American factory workers in direct competition with factory workers on the other side of the planet. So wages for American factory workers have been growing and growing and growing year after decade. And that stopped happening. Actually, the peak was in 1973. Average hourly wages for American workers are about what they were in 1973 today, if adjusted for inflation. So if wages are stagnating, but the economy needs to grow, and 70% of the economy is consumer spending, how do you make that happen? With more debt. So people are enabled to go into even more debt in order to buy more stuff to keep the economy moving. So this results in the financialization of the economy. What's, what does that mean? Well. Think of it this way. For you, the loan that you're taking out is an obligation to repay. For the banker, that same loan is an asset. The more the bank loans out, the better the bank is doing, right? Because it can anticipate the repayment of the loans with interest, and that's where the bank makes, makes money. So if the total amount of debt is growing, and it's growing, the financial industry is growing faster than manufacturing, it's growing faster than agriculture, it's growing faster than any other segment of the economy. That means that the financial industry is also gaining power within the, not only the economy, but also within, within the political system, because the bankers begin to lobby elected officials to change laws, repeal laws, do whatever is necessary to make it easier for the financial system to grow even more and even faster. So this is, this is a picture of what it's looked like since about uh, 1980. Um, there's been dramatic growth in debt in all phases, household debt, corporate debt uh, within financial institutions and then government debt at the top. And as you can see, government debt was not growing any faster than household. Actually, household debt was growing much faster than government debt during most of that time, right up until 2008. And something changes there. The economy begins to implode upon itself. People had taken out so much debt, taken on so much debt that they were finding they could no longer make the payments. Of course, the, the crash of the housing bubble was really the, the, the last straw because, um, and of course, we in California know this firsthand. Folks were you know, count, counting on increasing 
house prices. Uh, so they were taking out second mortgages and, and uh, uh, home equity lines of credit and, and so on, taking on all of this debt. And then when the housing bubble bursts, people find themselves with far more debt than they can possibly service. And so the whole thing starts to teeter and the government steps in as the borrower and spender of last resort in order to keep the economy from crashing. Now, this is, this is another picture of what's been happening. Uh, starting in 1940 now, you can see how uh, debt started growing faster than GDP, you know, back around 1970. But look at what's, look at the divergence. Uh, it's grown about three times, debt has grown about three times faster than GDP. Now, debt, in order for the economy with a, with a debt-based money, money system, in order for the economy to work, debt has to continually grow. Total debt has to continually grow, at least at the rate of GDP. But if it's growing at three times the rate of GDP, well, this is a prescription for an eventual crash. You know, we eventually get to the point where people can no longer make the payments and banks no longer want to loan any more money to people because they, they don't see that folks are, are going to be able to, to repay the money. And that's essentially where we are. I mean, it's, there are lots more complicated ways of explaining it, and there are lots of other bells and whistles involved, like uh, collateralized debt obligations and, and all, you know, all kinds of, of um, derivatives and so on. But what I just described to you is really the essence of it. Um, in some ways, it's best summed up by this statement here. Uh, one, of the, one of the most profound statements from a modern political leader. Um, <clears throat> and you know, essentially, what he said then is what we're still doing. If you look at, at what the Federal Reserve is doing, at, at, uh, uh, at the discussions in Washington, we're tr still trying to free up some money so this sucker doesn't go down. Okay, so that's, that's the story with the financial system. Now, if that's all that were happening, what we could anticipate is something like the Great Depression. We would have years of financial turmoil. Our standard of living would decline, and um, banks would fail. We might even have a few moments of you know, total economic near death you know, as we did in the 1930s. You know, there were some really scary moments in the 1930s. You know, banks were, were closed, people's gold was confiscated, I mean, it, one could go on and on. But at the end of the day, we'd reorganize, we'd, uh, you know, we'd nationalize the banks, reopen them, uh, reconstitute the mo monetary system, and then go on about our business and the economy would, would get back to normal, which is more growth. But that's not all that's going on. There are deeper underlying trends that mean that we're not going to get back to growth even at the end of a decade or two of depression. And energy is one of those deeper trends. I'm going to start by talking about oil because it's our most important energy source. Uh, and it's basically all of transport energy. So trade is completely dependent upon oil. Uh, we in this country started out with um, a, an enormous amount of this stuff. And in fact, in the early decades of the oil industry, the U.S. was not only the world's foremost oil producing nation, but the world's foremost oil exporting nation. We tend to forget that now because, of course, we've had decades of being the world's foremost oil importer. It wasn't always this way. Uh, discoveries of oil, which are the vertical green bars, um, peaked in the U.S. around 1930 and have generally been declining. Doesn't mean we're not discovering any more oil. We are. But in dribs and drabs, relatively small amounts compared to what we were finding in, in the good old days, if you will. 
Uh, meanwhile, U.S. oil production peaked around 1970, has generally been declining since then. I have a more up-to-date graph in, in a minute here, which zeroes in on what's, what's going on right now. Globally, um, discoveries have been declining since about 1963. Again, it doesn't mean we're not finding any more oil, but we're not finding it the way we were, you know, 40 years ago. Actual world oil production has been flatlined since about 2005. And if you're wondering why gasoline prices have gone crazy in the last few years, that's the biggest clue right there. Uh, <clears throat> even though demand for oil has been increasing, especially in places like China, you know, China is a much bigger car market these days than the U.S. is. Chinese bought 18 million cars last year. Americans bought 14 million. So the demand is there, but even though everybody's pumping flat out, actual production of regular crude oil has been flatlined since 2005. <clears throat> and the kind of, of resources that the industry is focusing on are different from what we used to see. This is what the oil industry looked like back in the 1930s, the old glory days. This is uh, a, a typical snapshot of the oil industry today where uh, you know, one has to drill in a mile or two of ocean water and a single exploratory well can cost half a billion dollars to drill and still come up empty. So the costs for exploration and production are dramatically increasing. Now, I mentioned, oh, thank you so much, that I was going to show a uh, more recent picture of U.S. production because U.S. production is actually increasing right now, uh, especially in places like uh, North Dakota. And the reason is, uh, very often you'll read newspaper articles that, you know, by somebody who really just you know, spent a couple of hours researching the subject and, and, and decided to write something. Uh, <laughs> um, you'll, you'll read that it's all about new technology. Well, no. Uh, the, the technology that they're using in North Dakota and North Texas is called hydrofracturing. It's been around since the early 1980s. Well, it's all, it's all these new resources that they've, that they've discovered. Well, no. The, the, the tight shale deposits in North Dakota have been known to geologists since the 1970s. Okay, so what's really new here? What's new is high oil prices. Because this stuff is expensive to get out of the ground. Hydrofracturing, it's usually called fracking, means you, know, you have to do a horizontal drilling and pump enormous out amounts of water and chemicals into the ground and set off explosives deep underground and, and so on. It's a much more complicated, investment-intensive, energy-intensive, water-intensive way of producing oil. Okay, so the, the industry wouldn't be doing it if they had any other options. And the only reason it's profitable is because oil prices have been up in the range of $100 and more per barrel, which were, these are prices that nobody 10 years ago thought were even remotely possible. I mean, when I say nobody, I, I mean, there were some folks I was in touch with, retired petroleum geologists and so on. But if you go to like the, the, uh, the International Energy Agency or the U.S. Ge Geological Survey or the U.S. Department of Energy and look at the forecasts they were making in, in the year 2000, they were saying we'd be paying $20 a barrel for, or, for oil right now. Worst case scenario, maybe $40 a barrel. Well, the price got up to $140 in 2008. So, of course, with prices that high, the industry starts looking around for all that crap that, you know, we never thought would, would be practical to produce. So it's likely that we will see a subsidiary peak around 2025 from, the, uh, from these unconventional sources like the, the tight shales. It doesn't mean the U.S. is going to be energy independent. It doesn't mean we're going to become uh, an exporter of oil, as some ignorant uh, journalists have, have said, in, even in prominent places like the New York Times. 
It just means that we have a little bit of reprieve for a few years. It doesn't even mean that prices will go down, because if prices do go down, they'll stop producing this stuff. Right? The only way we're going to get that little bump is if prices stay high. How high? Well, I'll, I'll show you in, in just a second. This is, this is a, a, just a graph showing what's happening with drilling costs these days, not only with oil, but also natural gas. And I should take just a moment to talk about uh, shale gas, because, of course, that's gotten also an enormous amount of of uh, press coverage, the fact that the Marcellus Shale in the, in the eastern part of the country and, and uh, other, other shales in, in Texas and, uh, and so on uh, have all of this natural gas and uh, there's so much of it in fact that we're going to have cheap natural gas for the next century, a hundred years of cheap natural gas. Don't you believe it? What's actually happening is the industry is producing below cost right now. Natural, same thing happened with natural gas prices a few years ago. They, they started going through the roof because of the depletion of conventional natural gas deposits in North America. So we, uh, natural gas had been at about $2 a thousand cubic feet, okay, for a long time. And then production started dropping off due to depletion, and the price started skyrocketing up to $10, 12 $14 a thousand cubic feet, and everyone was talking about, you know, a natural gas crisis. This, we're talking about 2004, 2005. So once again, with prices that high, it became practical for the industry to come in with horizontal drilling and, and hydro fracturing and produce some of this really crappy gas from tight deposits. Uh, and what they did was they jumped in with both feet and they overdrilled. They drilled tens of thousands of wells in a short period of time and produced this huge puff of gas that's moving through the system right now, drove down prices back to you know, $2.50 a thousand cubic feet, which is much lower than the actual cost of producing this stuff. So you have these companies like uh, Chesapeake Energy that specialize, it's the biggest of the frackers, that specialize in producing this unconventional natural gas, and they're losing money on every cubic fo foot of gas that they produce. How can they do that? Well, by con constantly attracting new investment capital. They're living on investment capital rather than income. It's the definition of a bubble, and it's bursting right now. If you, if you do a Google search of, of news stories about Chesapeake Energy, you can read about how the company is imploding, how their, their founder got kicked out of CEO status, and all, all the rest that's happening. This is, this is going to be happening to every one of these companies that specialize in fracking gas. And in 20 years, the whole industry will have dried up and blown away. But meanwhile, we will have drilled half a million wells, contaminated uh, uh, water tables across the country, and, and at the end of the story, we'll all be looking and saying, what was that about? <laughs> was that really worth it? How about coal? Well, we have 250 years worth of that, right? We can always turn coal into some kind of oil-like stuff and, and keep going. Well, not so fast. Um, you know, Let's, let's stay here a second. You know, the first geological survey of U.S. coal was done in 1907 by the USGS. And at that time, the analysis said that the United States had 5,000 years worth of coal. So after a while, by the 1940s, geolo coal geologists were saying, hey, come on, USGS. This just isn't, isn't realistic. You've got to do an, an updated uh, national survey. So they finally did that in the 1970s where, when they decided that we had 250 years worth of coal. So when you hear this statistic, it comes from a 1970s survey, right? And, but, but think about that. Between 1907 and the 1970s, we m somehow misplaced 4,700 years worth of coal. Where did it go? Well, it's still there. The, the coal is there. But the problem is the vast majority of it will never be mined because it's either too deep or the, the seams are too thin or it's such low-grade coal or, is it, or it's, um, has contaminants like uh, mercury and sulfur and so on. 
So what we really should be asking is, taking all that into account, when are we going to reach peak coal in the U.S. and the rest of the world? Well, for the U.S., it's going to look probably pretty much like this. We'll probably see the peak of U.S. coal production around 2025 to 2030. So that's not 250 years from now. That's more like 10 or 15 years from now. We won't be, if we do export coal, which would be a really, really bad idea, there's talk about opening ex coal export terminals in uh, Oregon and Washington now to export coal, guess where, to China. Yeah, I mean, it's, yes, it's possible to do that over a short period of time, but it's, I, it's hard to imagine a stupider thing to do from a, from the standpoint of, you know, long-term economics. Okay, let's get back to oil because this, this kind of economics applies uh, almost across the board. Um, think about that for a minute. Uh, the, the oil price that the industry needs, uh, not, that's not just the US oil industry, Saudi Arabia. You know, Saudi, the Saudis have had to make all kinds of promises to their citizens now to keep them from revol revolting. You've heard about the Arab Spring? Well, the countries that haven't had the big revolts have managed to keep the lid on by offering all kinds of social safety nets and perks and so on to their citizens. And to pay for those, they need oil in the range of $100 a barrel. So either you have a situation like here in the U.S. where it actually costs almost that much to produce uh, new oil, or you have situations where, you know, countries need oil oil at that, those prices in order to, you know, keep chaos from, from happening. And meanwhile, we know from recent economic uh, history that every time we have an oil price spike, the economy goes into recession. Uh, these vertical gray bars are recessions, and you can see every time there's a price spike. Now, we have had re a couple of recessions that weren't due to oil price spikes, but we haven't had an oil price spike that did not lead to a recession. So uh, correlation is not causality, but the, the evidence is kind of convincing, I think. Okay, so we have a fundamental energy problem. But we also have an environmental problem. And there are lots of different ways of looking at depletion of all kinds of resources, whether it's fresh water or wild fish in the ocean or topsoil that we're using at a rate of, or not using, we're eroding at a rate of 25 billion tons per year. Or rock phosphate, which is uh, absolutely essential to modern industrial agriculture, but it's a non-renewable resource and we're mining it and using it at, a, at an extraordinary rate. Or depleting materials like, um, you know, these, which this is a short list. These are just ones that happen to be useful in the renewable energy industry and, and in computer applications. Um, but even things like copper and... Uh, uh, iron ore. I mean, we're not about to run out of any of these things. Certainly, we're not about to run out of iron ore. But the folks who mine the stuff are having to go to lower and lower grade ores all the time. And the way they make that work is by applying more energy to the process of mining and to the process of, of smelting. So if energy is a problem too, then lower grade ores don't, kind of don't make sense. <sighs> yeah. And of course, you know, the, the biggest environmental problem of all time, which is climate change. And we're seeing that unfold right now in real time across the U.S. where more than half the country is, is in drought condition and the, uh, the forecast is not good. Uh, also in this category, I think we should maybe put uh, uh, industrial accidents like this, because as we look for energy in harder and harder places, accidents happen, and when they happen, they have higher and higher environmental cost. Uh, this, of course, is at the Deepwater Horizon in, in 2010. And if you look at the, uh, the cost to the insurance industry, 
of these kinds of weird weather and industrial accidents over the course of the last few years, you can see an escalating progression. Uh, 2010, which is the year of Deepwater Horizon, the, uh, the total cost was somewhere in the range of $250 billion of weird weather and industrial accidents. Last year, we passed that $250 billion mark by June as a result of events in Japan. So, you know, every year it's ratcheting up. We're not yet at the point where the costs of these kinds of events are large enough in and of themselves to choke off economic growth. But we're on a trajectory to reach that point just within a matter of years. So again, what we're looking at is not just one problem, but a, a very tightly bound system of problems having to do with a growth-based economy that is confronting limits to debt, uh, an energy system that's confronting limits to fossil fuels, and a an set of environmental problems that very largely have to do with the fact that we have been burning fossil fuels in ever larger quantities and, and undermining the climate in the process. So when we think about our global problems, I think it's important for us to see them from a systemic point of view rather than just looking at one or another in isolation. But all of this has to do with our growth-based economy because that's where it all really seems to, to come home. We, as I said at the very beginning, we've come to think of economic growth as necessary and inevitable. And let's face it, it feels good, right? More jobs, higher returns on investments. If you're a politician, of course you want to promise more economic growth. What politician wants to stand up in front of the electorate and say, well, if you vote for me, uh, I'll make sure that the economy contracts and we'll have fewer jobs and lower returns on investments. And yeah, anybody want to? <clears throat> not not too many people are going to vote for that politician. Maybe I would, but I didn't. You know. Um, and government needs more tax revenues, and the only way tax revenues are going to go up is with a growing economy. So it, you know, we've had it for decade after decade, and it feels really good. It's like we're on this train that's speeding up all the time, and everybody wants it to speed up even more. But we live on a finite planet. At the end of the day, we have to face up to the reality that not only are there theoretical limits to growth, but we are hitting those limits now in real time. Uh, some futurists say, you know, the, the future is already here, it's just not spread out evenly yet. So what we're seeing in places like Greece are, are really just harbingers of what we're going to be dealing with here when we hear about austerity and the Europeans in, in Greece and Spain and Italy having to deal with austerity. Well, when we talk about smaller government and, uh, you know, cutting down on deficits and so on. The way we're going to do that is with austerity, and it's going to feel just as bad here as it does anywhere else. And so we're seeing uprisings in country after country, people who are saying, hey, wait a minute, you've been bailing out the bankers. What about us? Well, <clears throat> we have some tough times ahead. I, at this point, I don't think there's any possibility of figuring out all of these problems, and then we have this soft landing where nobody feels any pain, and we just go on our merry way. You know, we have, we have green growth and, and a green economy and lots of green jobs and, and, uh, and cotton candy and, and marshmallow skies and all the rest. Uh, <laughs> no, it's, that's, that's not what we're facing. We're facing a, a difficult 
very, very difficult time of adaptation and adjustment. Now, we are very a, a very adaptable species. We can and we will adapt. The only question is, how will we do it? Will we do it the hard way or will, will we do it the intelligent way? The intelligent way involves building more resilience in every aspect of society and doing it as soon and as quickly as possible. What is, what's this resilience word all about? Well, when applied to human social systems, it means things like this. And in many ways, this is exactly the opposite of what we've been aiming for over the past few decades. We've been aiming for economic efficiency, right? And economic efficiency means doing away with redundancy in critical systems. It means uh, centralizing system control. It means, uh, it, it means doing away with inventories. Think of it this way. If you can grow corn cheaper in Iowa than anywhere else, then we should grow all of our corn in Iowa and nothing in Iowa except corn. That's economic efficiency. But it's exactly the opposite of resilience because if the corn crop in Iowa fails as, is, as it's doing right now, then nobody has corn and Iowa has nothing. So what we need to do instead is localize our economy, cut back on the speed, and build in inventories all over the place. Okay, so that has relevance for our food system, our transport system, our financial system, much more than we can actually talk about right now. Um, and maybe in, in questions we can, we can address some specifics along those lines. But I, I want to make the point that our economics as a discipline has also grown up during this relatively short period of time of rapid economic growth, the last 200 years, the industrial period. And as a result, economists have come to believe some very unrealistic things. They've come to believe that the environment is a subset of the economy. It's just a set of resources that we extract to transform into products which then become waste and go back into the environment, right? In reality, the human economy is a subset of the environment, always has been and always will be, and we have to get that straight. We have to understand that growth in population and consumption is inherently unsustainable. You can do it for a while, as we have for the last couple of hundred years, but you can't do it in perpetuity. So what we should be doing is aiming for a size of economy and a size of population that we think makes sense. What can the earth sustain? What can Humboldt County sustain? What can Arcata sustain in terms of population and consumption? And maybe we've already surpassed what can be sustained. In that case, we need to plan for how to cut back to a level that can be sustained over, over a long period of time. We have to understand that renewable resources have to be harvested at less than the rate of natural replenishment. That's so simple to understand. A 10-year-old can get that. Maybe for a PhD economist, it, take, it takes a little longer, but nevertheless, you know, it's, it's not that difficult. Non-renewable resources, there's only so much of copper or, or oil or coal or natural gas in the Earth's crust. So how much are we going to leave for future generations? Any. Um, Non-renewable resources have to be recycled wherever possible and where they can't be, then we just have to reduce our use of them as quickly and as much as we can. So that's, that's a short set of basic rules for a functional, sustainable economy. Here's a question. Can we follow those rules and still build one of these? No. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, it, this would be a good project for, a, for a, a college class, you know, see if we can make one of these things out of renewable resources uh, using 
uh, local labor and so on, I don't know. The way we build them now, of course, is with virtual slave labor on the other side of the planet using rapidly depleting non-renewable resources. So these things are unsustainable as they are right now. If we really think they are the greatest inventions in the history of humankind, which you know, evidently we, we do, and we, you know, nobody could ever possibly think of living without one, then we better start thinking of some other way of making them. Now, as, as I uh, have traveled around over the past few years talking to folks about um, these kinds of issues, energy and environmental issues and economic issues, I've seen uh, wonderful um, efforts taking place in communities around the country and things that generally go uncelebrated outside of those communities. You know, we, we just don't know how many wonderful things are actually going on. Um, this is a, oh, excuse me, go back here. This is an organization out in the, on the East Coast in uh, Massachusetts that's bringing renewable energy to low income neighborhoods. That's a great idea. Um, this is a company started by uh, some Irish folks that uses cell phone and GPS technology to uh, support uh, basically community supported hitchhiking, right? So, so it makes it it's safe and convenient and easy for people to share rides. Uh, this was a, an organization I came across in. Uh, in Montana, in a little town called Ronan, Montana. Uh, and they figured out very early on that the, the, the thing that was missing in local food systems was processing centers. You know, small scale producers generally don't have a you know, USDA approved uh, kitchen where they can make value added products, even something as simple as canned soup, right? can't do it if on a, on a really small basis. But if you have a community kitchen that's certified and you can rent space in that kitchen, that means that small scale local producers of all kinds of things can make value added products, make a decent living, and make a local food system really functional. Uh, this is in Los Angeles. It's just, you know, it's a, a, a place where anybody can go and build themselves a bike out of spare parts or, or get help in, in uh, maintaining their bike. Community currencies happening in, in communities all over this country and around the world. Community cu currencies are hard to get going but, and hard to maintain. But in hard economic times, like the Great Depression, like the kind of time we're, we're moving into, they're a kind of insurance policy. If the, if the national currency breaks down, becomes really dysfunctional, you have an alternative. And if you use the local currency, if it really does flourish, then it keeps money within the local community. It doesn't leak out into, the, into Wall Street, basically. I know you've already had discussion of transition towns here, and uh, I've, I've seen this phenomenon from its very beginnings, and I think it's just one of the most brilliant organizing strategies ever. Um, because it's so positive and it's, it's attractive to people. It, it looks more like a, a party than a protest march. We need the protest march too, but we also need something that's going to actually solve people's problems, help people solve their own problems. And another thing that could, could assist with that is something I'm calling community economic laboratories, but you can call it whatever you want. Um, <clears throat> Every community just about has already some element of, of the, the economy of the future, even if it's nothing more than a credit union and a food co-op. But usually these are thought of as being fringe and alternative. And may, maybe most of the people in the community don't even know they exist. So what if we brought them together in a central location and made it really clear what was going on there so that people who have time on their hands and they want to volunteer, they know where to go. People who have unmet needs know where they can go to maybe get some help. 
<clears throat> there are examples in my book of places that have already started to uh, put some of these things together. So altogether, you know, even though we face some tough times, I think it's important that we maintain a positive attitude about this. And that may seem like a crazy thing to say after all that we've, we've just seen with the economic system, the climate and all the rest. But, you know, if you give up, if you, if you maintain a pessimistic state of, of, of mind, then you're not doing anyone any good. It's really the biggest cop-out you can imagine. So what we need to do is focus on what we can have more of even as we consume less energy and less in the way of consumer products. And it turns out the things that we can have more of are actually a lot more important to our psychological well-being and our happiness. And of course, there have been numerous studies by cross-cultural and cross and international studies by psychologists showing that, you know, if you don't have the basics, if you don't have enough uh, energy to heat your house at, in, in, at night in the winter, if you don't have enough energy to cook your food, then you're not going to be very happy. But once, once those basic needs are met, there's very little correlation between happiness and levels of energy use. So we in the US, for example, use twice as much energy per capita as Europeans. Are we twice as happy? No. So as we reduce, and we will be reducing our consumption over time, if we specifically target these things, and we can do, you know, it could be done at the national level by ditching GDP, for example, and adopting uh, an alternative indicator like uh, a genuine progress indicator or gross national happiness as the little nation of Bhutan has, has done. If we did that as a country, then we could continue to experience uh, progress in the sense of uh, a quality of our community and family life and, and cultural life, even as we downsize our, our economy. So that's, that's the possibility that lies ahead of us. And as, uh, as communities, it, how do, it, it's all just a question of how we make this work for ourselves. And it's, you know, I spend a lot of time sitting in front of computers, uh, reading about what's going on with the climate, with the, uh, with the European debt crisis, and so on and so on. And if you spend several hours a day doing that, I can guarantee you're going to be depressed. <laughs> so, watch more comedy. Well, yeah, but turn off the damn tube altogether and get out and start spending more time in nature and especially start spending more time with your neighbors and other people in your community because that is what is going to get us through these tough times. It's not having you know a 50 pound sack of beans in, in my shed out back. I'm not saying that's a bad idea, but it's it's how many people do I know and what's the quality of my relationships with those people. That's what's going to get us through. So I would urge you to focus on those things. What and, and who in your community is doing the things that will enable life to go forward in time? Who's, who's making your energy? Who's making and repairing shoes in, in town, you know? who's growing food, these are the people that you need to celebrate and support, right? Are you shopping at uh, store, local stores or are you shopping at Walmart? I mean, this, this is really basic stuff, but this, these are the kinds of questions that it really, really comes down to. Can we build community resilience? Absolutely, and we can have fun doing it. Thank you.
Okay, so we have time for questions. And just before we get to questions, let me say something about my organization, Post Carbon Institute. We have this uh, website called energybulletin.net, and I urge you to look at it if you don't already, because um, it's a wonderful aggregator. It brings together articles and information about all the things I've talked about tonight uh, by lots of wonderful writers and, and analysts and so on. It's about to transition to uh, uh, resilience.org. And we will have uh, pages not only on energy, but also on food and society, uh, environment, and so on. So it'll, it'll be a one-stop uh, shop for you know, all, the, all the information you need to know what's going on in the world and, and what to do about it. OK, so questions, comments, thoughts? Yeah. What is the, some of the sources for those projections? Uh, yeah, uh, sources uh, specific. Yeah, you know, we'd have to go through specific slides. I've tried to use um, uh, the data is from public sources, like uh, 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 the coal data is from World Energy uh, Council (WEC). And the analysis is from uh, uh, Energy Watch Group in Germany. Uh, I, I actually wrote a book on world coal supplies called uh, Blackout a few years ago. And, uh, and so the, the analysis and data are all cited in exquisite detail in, in that book. Yeah. But you know, I, we would have to go through the, the, the others. The, the, it's all public uh, information. Yes. Um, I wonder, does a guy like you ever get invited or to the White House, or does Bill McKibben ever get to speak with the president? And I just wondered, with the coming political elections, what are your thoughts, your hopes, or your concerns regarding um, President Obama or President Trump? Did everybody hear that question, or do I need to repeat it? OK. Um, I know Bill has spoken outside the White House, on, <laughs> where he got arrested. Uh, I, I've, I've never been invited to the White House. I have. I've spent time, you know, pounding the pavement, uh, uh, talking to uh, staffers of members of Congress and trying to alert them to some of these problems. And it was a pretty frustrating experience, I have to say. Um, there are definitely people at high levels of government who understand most of this stuff. I don't know if anyone has put it all together, but there's a lot of incentive to ignore most of this information as much as possible. I mean, it's, it's kind of a poison pill if you're a politician. You, you don't, not only do you, you, you definitely don't want the general public to understand this stuff. And so the less time you spend talking about it, even amongst yourselves, the better. Um, and uh, I, I've had so many experiences of talking to people in fairly high echelons, not only in the political sphere, but also in the economic sphere. Hedge fund managers, I, I had lunch one time with a guy who manages a $100 billion hedge fund. And he's very concerned about a lot of these things, but I asked him, you know, how many of your colleagues are? And he said, almost none of them. You know, so there are a few people here and there at high levels. But, you know, sometimes I hear people who say, oh, you know, the, the, the people high up in government, they understand all this stuff and they have this plan, you know, or, or the Illuminati or, you know, some, some big conspiracy. I, I just don't believe it. On the basis of my conversations with the few people that I've met who, who really do have substantial, you know, power and influence, my, my assessment is that, you know, there really isn't very high awareness. And there's not much interest among many of them in understanding these things. Yes? Is there any discussions in the people that you've seen about how you convince people and politicians and at and how they can, and the ones that do understand it, how they can get movement without hands? Um, <clears throat> 
how to get movement without panic. That's that's a big challenge. I think, you know, frankly, the transition movement is addressing this as successfully as anybody. You know, by by giving out the information, but in in a friendly, smiling way, and saying, "Hey, you know, we we can deal with this. Let's get together," and and doing it on the basis of uh, a ground up rather than top down, because if if we insist on the political leaders. Uh, grasping this and doing something about it, I'm afraid it's there. Even, even if they do something, I'm afraid they'll do the wrong thing. <laughs> yeah, you can count on it. Um, so, uh, you know, and and the few p political leaders who do understand this stuff say the same thing every time they say, "Yes, I get it, but there's nothing I can do because I have the you know the the people the electorate." Would just you know toss me out on my ass if I if I brought this stuff up. So until there's until the the, the people are you know start to get it and demand some accountability and some action, then I think it's it's you know extremely unlikely that we'll get any really constructive action from the top down. The common myth is that politicians are leaders. Actually, followers. Yeah. So until we're there, they can't. Yeah. This this is the thing. If you if you actually make something happen from the grassroots, the first thing you're going to see is some politician get in front of the parade and want to take credit for it. So, yeah. I was wondering uh, if you know of any economists who have developed a theory of uh, like a stable state economy, one that doesn't rely on constant growth as uh, the basis of its. Yeah, economists who have thought about a st stable economy rather than a constantly growing one. Well, actually, up until the 20th century, a number of economists uh, assumed that we would we would get to a point where the economy was as big as it needed to be, and that that would be it. John Stuart Mill, for example, did that. Uh, more recently. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not going to blank on his name. I'm not going to do it. John, uh, Daly, Herman Daly, um, who, who was for a, a short time actually a, uh, a principal economist at the World Bank, um, but it proved not to be a very good fit <laughs> for him or for the World Bank. But Herman Daly has been writing about the steady state economy for, for several decades, and he's one of the leading lights of what's called ecological economics, uh, which is a subdiscipline that's that's uh, you know very very promising. It's it uh, you know the, the basic principles that I I showed there of of uh, what a what a sustainable economy would look like. That's all straight out of Herman Daly and ecological economics. Yeah. What do you imagine is will happen to the the, mil the billions of people who are the most oppressed by debt and the most uh, deprived of resources? and um, the other qualities that you mentioned. What's going to happen to them? In, I mean, how can they develop resilient communities they, having the very least of any communities on the planet? Yeah, what's going to happen to the, the poorest of the poor? Well, um, in, in some cases, I think it's going to be a pretty dire situation. In others, in other cases, you know, f folks who have, who, who don't rely upon all the conveniences of modern life, won't miss them when they aren't available anymore. Um, the, the question of, of what, they're, wh what heavily indebted people are, are going to do about debt, now that's, a, that's an interesting one. Because the, the total amount of debt in the world right now is uh, vastly greater than what can be repaid or serviced. So there, over the course of the next few years, one way or another, we're going to see massive default. And there are different ways that default can happen. It can happen through hyperinflation. It can happen through bankruptcies. It can happen through uh, other, other ways. OK, so uh, the, what we're trying to do right now is make sure that 
the ultimate holders of the debt, which is the banks and the investors, get paid off. Um, and we. <laughs> yeah, let's save the rich guys, and uh, and the hell with everybody else. You know, the the average American household has seen its net worth plummet in the last few years, but you know the folks in Wall on Wall Street not so much. Um, and, if we, if our leaders continue pursuing this this uh, strategy as they're doing in Europe as well as here in the U.S., the result in the end is going to be uh, extreme destabilization of society. We will see, you know, rioting in the streets and, and all the rest. Um, so somehow, hopefully sooner rather than later, um, we've got to make the people who made the bad bets in the first place. Pay, take some of the loss. Take most of the loss, in fact. Take it all. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Who are we going to vote in that's going to actually help us with the that? Who are we going to vote in? Yeah, you know, I wish I wish I could say one of the political parties had it all together in that regard, but unfortunately, it's just not the case. You know, I, 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 like many people, had high hopes for Obama, and of course, the economic team he brought in immediately upon being elected were the, exactly the people who were responsible for the, the uh, economic crisis in the first place. So uh, it's it's pretty discouraging, and that's one more reason why I think we really have to deal with this from on a grassroots basis. Um, I, I, just to respond yeah. to that, I have a literature here on the Green Party, yeah. and yeah. I have a presidential candidate, Jill Stein, 2012, and I think the Greens have it together, they have the comprehensive vision, so Jill Stein yeah. is the candidate. Great. Um, JillStein.org, sure. I, I know Jill Stein, as a matter of fact. Yeah, she. Um, sure. Um, Tesla was quoted once as saying that, um, that when science begins to seriously investigate non physical phenomena in the universe, that it will advance more in a single decade than it has in all of its previous centuries of existence. So I guess my question is, is do you see any hope for that happening perhaps in any of our lifetimes? Like, do you think that it's possible through a combination of technology and culture jamming along with the massive and pervasive cultural context for change that we could ever see something that resembles some kind of a, a chill, peaceful world to live in? Yeah, you know, I, I, I don't. I think that the, the technology that's going to get us through this is going to be a, a technology of the soul, of the spirit, of of society, rather than you know some gadget or some new kind of energy source. Um, <clears throat> Adaptation is mostly about changing our minds and changing our behavior, changing how we relate to one another. Uh, so if we, if we focus on that, I think we'll accomplish uh, a heck of a lot. Yes? Maybe, um, I was thinking maybe it would be a good idea to adapt and not to measure the how we do it. Right. Not, not wait for the document to do it, but like in presentations like this, we can say, here's the GDP, and then here's this alternative measure. Right. Because the GDP actually, the things go bad, the GDP can go up from the past. Right. All these things raise the GDP, but we should start using a new measure right away. We don't have to wait for that. Yeah, yeah. Well, uh, a, a really good alternative is uh, is genuine progress indicator, which was developed um, over a number of years uh, by an organization in San Francisco, a, a nonprofit which unfortunately no longer exists, called Redefining Progress. But uh, GPI is still alive and well. You can you can uh, look it up on Wikipedia. The state of Maryland is starting to use GPI. 
city of city of Seattle. Uh, what are the elements of GPI? It rather than just measuring the total amount of, of money uh, flowing through the economy, it it looks also at unpaid work that's going on in the economy. It looks at uh, you know how many people are imprisoned, what how much of money is being spent on on uh, military and weaponry as opposed to you know productive. Uh, uh, elements within society. So it's uh, it's not perfect, but it's a huge step in the right direction. I'm going to get a lot of my questions out of your peripheral vision. It yeah. relates directly to that and also the, the previous question about ec economists looking at GDP and flat growth. So when you put up that 2,000 years of flat GDP and then the, 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 the growth period, yeah. the things that popped into my mind were a lot of interesting stuff happened in that period. Some of it was good, some of it was bad, but certainly interesting things. And then thinking of my own life, I'm glad that my life has grown and evolved and progressed since 10 years ago when I was 18, and that, that I've made progress, so to speak. And so I think your second to last slide brought up all those things that weren't limited by, yeah. but you know, they didn't have limited growth, like arts and cultures and, you know, and spirituality. And so my question is, on that second slide of all those things, have you encountered communities that have had flat or even negative economic growth and that have said, I don't mind because we're growing in these other prosperity yeah. countries. We don't mind around making more money. I don't mind that I'm still making $13 an hour. That's what I was making 20 years ago because my life has improved in all these other ways. And in, in particular, you know, medium size, you know, 50000 people communities or 100,000 people communities that feel that they've been able to, to not grow economically but grow in those other categories. Yeah. There are no examples in the U.S. Um, <laughs> <laughs> however, however there, there is the nation of Bhutan, you know, which has, as I mentioned it earlier, developed gross national happiness as, as, a, as a goal back in the 1970s. And, uh, and they recently uh, hosted a conference at the UN, which I was uh, happy and privileged to attend, that, where they brought this to the international community. And there were you know, eminent speakers from all around the world and so on. And said, OK, now look, you know, uh, we, we've got to get away from GDP. More and more economists are saying so. So what are we going to have as, as a replacement? And here's, here's a possibility. So there, there is more and more discussion along those lines. And, and by the way, I do have a slide that shows a comparison between GDP. I don't have it with me. Well, it's somewhere on my computer. Uh, a comparison between GDP since 1970 and GPI. GDP is up and up and up and up. GPI peaked in the early 1970s and has generally declined in the US since then. So our, our real standard of living as measured by genuine progress, has declined, even as GDP has gone up. Yeah. Uh, I know this is a university. I, I wonder if you talk about student debt, what that's happening in the world. Student debt. Yeah, the question is, is about student debt. And you know, I used to teach college myself, and this was always a, a, a crisis of conscience for me. Because I, I thought it was really important that at least some young people got an education in the systems of society so they'd be able to go out and manage and reinvent those systems as we move through these you know, very critical times. So they need that education. But in order to get that education, they had to take on thousands and sometimes tens of thousands of dollars of debt. And I felt really conflicted about, about uh, my role in that system. I'm no longer in that system, but I, you know, I, I, I think that we have to find a way to, to deal with this. You know, our, our current model for higher education just doesn't work. We're preparing young people for a future that's not going to exist, and we're requiring them to, to go into mountains of debt in order to do that. It just doesn't make sense. We've got to find cheaper and more direct ways of imparting the skills that they need. And I'm, I don't have a, an easy answer to how, how to make that happen. You know, uh, it's, uh, I think the community college system is in some ways a, you know, a, a, a good transitional. It can, could be a good transitional 
um, uh, you know, process if, if we reinvent community colleges so that they're, they're teaching the kinds of skills that young people really need. Uh, but jubilee. yeah, ju debt jubilee is what we really need. We're, we're going to need the cancellation of debt just all across the board. Yeah. Wipe it clean. Yeah. Yeah, you're in the back. Yeah. Uh, question is about fresh water. Well, it's a it's a serious limiting factor. I mean, uh, we're talking about hydrofracturing, uh, whether it's whether it's gas in the Marcellus or in in Pennsylvania or or oil in North Dakota, uses enormous amounts of fresh water. So if we're in the middle of a drought, what do we want to use our, our precious water for? For for fracking, right? Yeah, really. Um, you know, it, it takes it takes water to produce energy, and it takes energy to move water around because most of the water we, we use is for irrigation. So we have kind of a conundrum here. The only way we're going to solve it is to use less of both, use less water and irrigation, and less energy. So uh, you know that's that's where that's that's how we have to start thinking. And how do we so how do we use less water in, in irrigation? Well, we have to transform agriculture uh, from from the monocrop system of in, industrial agriculture that we have now to mixed, more permaculture style uh, production where we keep the moisture within the soil and 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 promote you know higher. Um, uh, higher productivity by making making uh, m making agriculture more of a, an ecosystem rather than you know uh, a monoculture. Yeah. You know. I presume, or I don't know if you read the book Aftershocks by women and all of them, it basically gives you individuals that broke the last bubble economy effectively in 2006, and now basically are saying. Yeah, well, the <clears throat> uh, question is about um, possibility for high, high levels of inflation. I think that is uh, extremely likely a few years down the line. I think it's not likely over the short term because we're an inherent, in an inherently deflationary situation. When you have lots and lots of debt that's defaulting all at once, what that does is it removes money from the system. Remember, money is debt and debt is money. So if debt is disappearing because of default, that means that money is disappearing, right? So the reason that, we, that the Federal Reserve and the US Treasury have been pumping trillions of dollars in the US economy is to keep it imploding because all of this money is disappearing because of you know, bad debt. Um, and a lot of people have looked at that and said, well, you know, this is inherently hyperinflationary, but we haven't actually seen that much inflation and the, yet. yet. And the reason is it's, you know, the government, the Fed and the Treasury are pushing against this tidal wave of default and deflation. Now, at a certain point, you know, through, as a result of desperation or miscalculation, it's likely to tick over the top, and then then we do get to a hyperinflationary scenario. But I think it's a few years down the line, and you know, 2013 to 2016. That's that's very possible. Yeah. Yeah. Last question. Yes. Yeah. 
talking about is a, a situation where they have panic without movement. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the worst case scenario. One environmental factor is in Colorado, and I assume perhaps if you someone else here might have an update on this. The Greenland ice situation. I saw a thing on the TV the other night on TV about how the water is pouring down to the bottom and lubricating um, the hard pan where the ice meets the rock, and it's about ready to slide in. Just to let anybody guess how fast it's going to happen. Right. It's not just the uh, financial oh, yeah. craziness, it's also what they've done as a result of using all the technology the wrong way. Absolutely. Using, you know, it's not money, what it's doing to the other part. So what happens if the fresh water comes down and it locks up and it starts a problem with the climate, a real big yeah. problem with it, where England starts to get into Yeah, well, Look, um, th there are lots of things I didn't talk about. I, I didn't want to be too, you know. Um, an another one, you know, just to... <laughs> Methane release, you know? I mean, as the permafrost warms, billions of tons of methane get released, which over the short term are about 100 times as potent as greenhouse gases as CO2. So this starts a feedback loop as, as you know, uh, methane gets released, that increases the greenhouse effect, warms, and then as, as, as the, the planet warms, that, that releases even more methane, and, and we end up with a, a kind of, you know, almost a doomsday scenario. Yeah, yeah, I mean, all of, those, all, all of that is, is, is possible, and it's, and, and, it's all, and it's all happening. And in some ways, you know, um, one, one could look at all of this and say, you know, the faster it crashes, the better. <laughs> um, it, it, except, you know, I mean, from a human standpoint, that, that, that's, not, that's not a good solution. So, you know, I, I, I'm not among those who say, well, we, you know, we should cheer for collapse and, and hope it ha happens as soon as possible, because I think we, we do need time to prepare for these events, but but yeah, there's there's some there's some very scary stuff happening in in the uh, not just in Greenland, but uh, uh, in in the oceans, the, the the acidification of the oceans. That's very possible that the oceans will be dead in less than a century. I think about the implications of that. So, well, that's not a very cheery note to end on, <laughs> but. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. 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 Okay, you, you are. I, know. I this is a university, and you have a homework assignment. So, we we have a little bit of business to transact before you can leave. So, what I want you to do. First of all, um, on that cheery note that we just ended on, uh, we're going to uh, have a little assignment, and then we're going to, uh, uh, I have a trivia question for everybody. Uh, to start with, um, I want you all to take off your name badges. So you have name badges. They're made of plastic. And one thing I want to tell you is that the, um, the one thing that we have as a civilization managed to produce is something that really lasts forever, and that is plastic. We really have a really great thing going here with plastic. So we're going to recycle everything. Uh, one thing that we've been trying to do at this conference is do a zero waste event. So as part of our zero waste, take off your badges, and I gave you an assignment earlier. And what that assignment was is to think of two things you're going to do and commit to do in the next six months, and we're going to hold you to it. So what I want you to do is take off your badge, take out your little card, if you have one, or on a piece of paper, write down for me two things you're going to do. And the next time we get together, we're going to talk about that. OK? Would you please do that to start with? And I have something I want to show you. And it'll just take a minute. Uh, but take out a pen, take out a paper, and write for me the things you're going to do now to um, change your particular world. And in the meanwhile, I'm going to give you a trivia question. 
and we're going to celebrate something. For all these PowerPoints on our there will be, uh, we will pro we'll provide you uh, with all the presentations that, uh, that we have. I don't necessarily have everything, but everything that we have copies of, we're going to um, share with everyone. So, and websites and everything else, you're going to get all this information. We have, if we have your email address, I hope we do, uh, that will, um, you'll, you should receive it at that, uh, uh, in the near future. Okay, so trivia question. Today is the 43rd anniversary of something. I want you to tell me what today is the anniversary of. Today is the 43rd anniversary of man's walk on the moon. So I want to leave you with that thought and think if we could do that 43 years ago, think of what we could do in the next 40 years. Okay, so everyone, think of that image when you leave today. We'll be in touch with you in the near future. And uh, let's, let's stay tuned because I think we have a lot of exciting things to come in the near future. I have a picture coming up in just a second that I think will leave us an indelible print of what we want to think about as we leave here. And uh, this is an image that I think we all have somewhat burned in our memories and we want to pass this along to our children and it's an image that I I think about quite often so leave leave all your things with your commitments at the desk uh, when you leave that's the photo that changed the world and remember that as you leave tonight Leave your cards at the desk. Thank you for coming to our show.